Here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> How was your Memorial Day? Uh, Memorial Day was I mean, good. Oh, my God. July was also good. <laughs> All of my summer holidays have been good so far. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, it's a long day. We've been running after kids all day. Yes, we have. And it's been a joy. It's it's a joy, but it's wonderful, yes. isn't it? Yes, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, but why I had you on here today for several reasons. Um, number one, I wanted your perspective uh, for the audience to hear how it was uh, when we started Glamour Salon. Um, to give your view and give your testimony of what you saw your dad and I do in oh. order to come uh, for Glamour Salon to come in existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, I just want to say that if it had not been for my children holding up my arms so many times and coming in, even working in the salon, uh, I don't know what I would have done. I'm just so blessed today that I have two wonderful, awesome children, which are girls, but uh, they're women of God now. So uh, I want their perspective. Uh, so today we're going to have Candace Johnson, my youngest one, give her perspective. Um, as you know, we opened up the salon in 1996, and... Do you remember, Candace, when we opened up the salon, uh, how God dealt with me prior to that in terms of dealing with me in prayer uh -huh. uh, at the church? Uh -huh. And also, um, I was at the altar. I was slain at the altar. Yeah, I remember that. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so can you go from there, kind of? Give a background of what you saw uh -huh. or uh, what you think. Because reason why we want this is because we have said week after week that Glamour Salon is not like any other salon. Uh -huh. It's God-centered. Uh -huh. It is God-constructed. And um, you're at the age now where you have experience of going to other salons. And you can give a, uh, a good opinion on comparing Glamour Salon mm -hmm. to other salons. So I'm going to let you kind of give your overview of how you thought things uh, came to pass and and how it was in terms of walking with me, mm -hmm. walking this vision out. Mm -hmm. Sure. So my sister and I have pretty much been shop babies our whole lives. I know that's <laughs> right. Raised up in the uh, beauty yes. shop. Yes. My mom... Um, my earliest memory was of her having a salon in our home when we lived on the west side of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And our, the salon was in the basement initially. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful environment mm -hmm. because it allowed her to be home with us and, um, you know, gave us an audience as kids. We yes. could come down and entertain the, <laughs> uh, sure the, did. the uh, patrons. And, you know, my sister and I are both pretty social Mm -hmm. And that kind of allowed us to have some people, more people to pay attention to us all day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, then she worked at other salons outside of the home mm -hmm. for certain periods of time, which um, that was also another experience. We learned a lot of things through that as well because, um, you know, there were lessons all along the way. I, one distinct memory was... Um, that she wouldn't allow us to just walk in from school. We would come to the shop after school and, and go to the back and mind mm -hmm. our own business. She, right. It was very important and inst instilled in us to be kind and gracious and greet people. Mm -hmm. She wanted us to make con eye contact and say hello to pretty much everyone that was there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you get off of you're off of um, school and you're in a bad mood and, you know, you, you won't, don't want to do it, but you kind of had to muscle through because it was the rule. Yes. And that that came to be a very um, important lesson later in life. Okay. Um, you know, throughout my life, as mom said, I did go through medical school and complete my training in emergency medicine. And it was important along the way to have knowledge of things. It was important to study. It was important to... Um, you know, put the hard work in. But one of the things I think got me very far and, and opened a lot of doors was the just being congenial. Yeah, and even true. despite your attitude or your feeling, putting that aside, especially in your professional setting, and being kind and welcoming and approachable. Um, so that was definitely, that, that kind of started there, and it carried me along as I went along. Um, I, you know what, that's 
something that you should say that mm -hmm. about that lesson of being able to push beyond how you feel mm -hmm. and speak and be cordial. Mm -hmm. I was so proud of you when you uh, finished your residency and at the program, uh, the head resident director came to me and your dad and she was actually in tears. Mm -hmm. She s said to us that she's never ever seen anyone as compassionate mm -hmm. and relatable to the clients or to the patients mm -hmm. that you were. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I mean, just in tears. I was just so blessed by that. If you hear some sound in the back, that's my grandson and my <laughs> granddaughter. So I was so blessed by that because I know that those are things. I, I'm a, a believer that it takes a village mm -hmm. to raise uh, children. And I'm so happy that inside of our village, mm -hmm. we had some of the most wonderful people oh, yeah. come in our lives to the point where um, they were no longer just clients, but they were aunts and uncles mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And so I, I'm just really Whoa. thankful, and I'm thankful for you and Monique and for your obedience mm -hmm. of how you uh, did follow my instructions mm -hmm. because sometimes I would be so busy that I might not even notice if you spoke or not. Mm -hmm. And to this day, my clients of over 30 years still comment on how kind and how you all come in a room and speak, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That was a good good tip. Good tip, <laughs> yeah. So, so then, you know, I working in other salons, you know, there was... There were environments that you didn't necessarily want for your clientele. Right. And you weren't able to um, control that environment, being that it wasn't yours. And I don't, I believe that you really didn't have a desire initially to open up your own no, salon. No, I did not. It was a large no. undertaking. Yes. Um, but I do remember that day you had gone to the altar and we were kind of sitting in the car like, oh, she's still at the altar, church is over. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Taking, ah. But um, when she arrived, when when she did come back to the car and talk to us about you know what she'd experienced, um, you know the she had gotten the revelation to open up her own salon mm -hmm. and you know it's been it's been more than a salon it's been a ministry I think you always looked at it that way yeah um, it's it and I have being that I went to college out of state I've been to other salons where there's a lot of gossip and um, dissension between people and, you know, some of the music might be bad or some of the, um, you know, just things that other people are coming in the cell might be bad. Right. Like <laughs> also, hot stuff. Hot, yeah, stolen yeah. items, things like that. And it's, you've always had the utmost professionalism in the salon and more than that, though, made it a place where people can find rest and refuge and and not just getting their hair done, but getting wise counsel, prayer. Wow. You know, and that's that's been a blessing. Yeah. And it's been a blessing to watch you pursue your dreams. You know, now Thank that you. when it became your dream, there, it wasn't always easy. There were definitely challenges, but that was um, a great lesson just to see. It wasn't a lesson that you had to teach, per se, but just walking through it. Yeah. Well, you know about challenges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> about great challenges. And that's uh, something that I want to talk about later on too um, while we're taping this session I mean <laughs> but also um, just to let you know about Candace um, Candace is a like I said she's a woman of God how old were you when you were filled with the Holy Spirit seven seven years old mm -hmm. and she's always been uh, a, a little evangelist <laughs> even as a child she would influence her peers to uh, get to know God and to love God. Uh, she was one of those individuals that she was the salt of the earth, and she would go into a classroom situation and would not be afraid to talk about God. And even though she is very serious about her relationship with God. She is so much fun, very free. She enjoys life. And uh, she, she opens up herself to new adventures. 
she doesn't put God in a box. So I thank God for that, that, um, that she is a woman of God that loves God. She's filled with the Spirit, and she doesn't put God in a box. Mm -hmm. So you got saved at 7. I remember many a times, you know, we would have conversations at the shop. But this one particular time, we were talking about being saved, and you were saying to me, well, you almost can't help but be saved. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, what did you mean by that? Because, you know, we know salvation is a choice. Mm -hmm. So what did you mean by that? Um, I don't, when did I say this? For this reason? Um, yeah, we were talking about being raised in a safe home. Oh, yes. I mean, yes, because I was filled with the Holy Spirit at seven. Um, but I kind of, you know, we, we were raised in a, in a household where it really wasn't optional that you go to church. And, you know, dad was very... Um, he get, he's taught his own Bible study every Saturday morning <laughs> <laughs> and in addition to our own Bible studies at church. Uh -huh. and, you know, and we were raised with the principles of God. And the Bible says train up a child the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. But obviously, people, some people do depart at some point. Well, wait a minute. Let, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go see Sesame Street? Did you go see Sesame Street? Yeah. Did, did we go see WWF wrestling? We did. We did. Yeah. Did we go see Michael Jackson? Uh-huh. So those are things that sometimes the church poo-poo on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, you know, I think, you know, we're very liberal. I think the most important thing is that you didn't raise us in a legalistic environment. You always encouraged us, despite the fact that we were going to church with you guys because we had to, mm -hmm. that we develop our own relationship with God, oh, a okay. personal relationship. And I think that's... The most important part, you know, it wasn't a matter of we can't, we're not allowed to go to prom, we're not allowed to do this. It was Well, everything wasn't no, no, no. Right. You know, there was a lot of freedom. Because you went to God. homecoming. Went to you? homecoming, Went yeah. to uh, dances, mm -hmm. didn't you? I was homecoming princess, I think. Oh, <laughs> One of these man. years. <laughs> homecoming princess, mm -hmm. yes, that's a winter awesome. Winterfest, one of those things. So. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, so we had some a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. um, probably some some more than other people that went to our church, but we were sincere in our desire for God. And I think, of course, getting filled with the Holy Spirit allows you even more strength and power to continue and build your own relationship with God because mm -hmm. you have your prayer language and um, you can have that you know, intimate worship and God can, you know, through the Holy Spirit, reveal scripture to you in a way that's meaningful in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, no, it was, and, and it was a great task, I'm sure, to be a full-time working mom and also raising kids and uh, also starting a business and you had the, the help of a wonderful man of God and my father mm -hmm. but still Amen. it's a lot you know the the duties of the home naturally fall a little bit heavier on women yes um, so doing all of that in addition to starting your own business um, how did how did you get the strength to do all of that well I mean you, you know my help come from the Lord mm -hmm. And I believe that when you are called to do something, mm -hmm. it's an anointing on your life, and uh, you get a supernatural strength mm -hmm. um, to do that. You know, I, it's a question that I want to uh, also address. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, uh, are any, either one of your daughters, are they going, are they going to go into your footsteps? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, mm-mm. <laughs> No, they, they don't have that desire. Mm -hmm. God's called them to something else. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about what God has called you to. Mm -hmm. um, can you just elaborate on that? Like I said, I want the listening audience to get to know us as a family, mm -hmm. as a, a, of course, as a business. We, they've met several of the um, team members. Oh, good. So... I want them to get to know you because you are moving to Dallas mm -hmm. to start your second endeavor uh, that God has called you to. You've been called to a hospital there mm -hmm. to um, be the salt of the earth mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So I want you to just elaborate. You, you didn't have a desire to go into uh, cosmetology, but your desire was medicine. So talk about that journey. Yeah, I, I think... Also, not only did I not have the desire, I didn't have the talent to go into cosmetology. <laughs> so that probably made the decision for me. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, I remember saying that I wanted to be a physician at a very early age. And mm -hmm. people, you know, when you're going through the process of applying, they ask you, why did you want to be a doctor all the time? Mm -hmm. And it was probably a mixture of, you know, God planted the seed early. And then once I said it, you, you say you want to be a doctor, everybody's face lights up. So you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm on to something. I'm going to stick <laughs> stick to this. <laughs> Everyone's so excited. This must be good. Okay. So I kind of stuck with that. Um, I remember you said you wanted to be a veterinarian as yeah, well. Yeah, I did love animals at one point. And, yeah, that, that changed. So. Why did that change? <laughs> I think I realized that I really didn't like all animals. I pretty much just like dogs. Right. And, you know, veterinarians, they go through a whole lot more. They, they do a lot, so. Yes, yes. Yeah, so then going through college at the Harvard of the South, Tennessee State University. <laughs> Go HBCU. HBCU. Um, you know, I had a, a, a bit of some doubts because some of the courses, organic chemistry and f physics and all these prerequisites were very difficult and laborious. I saw some of my other friends with lighter majors having more fun, studying less and... You know, I kind of thought, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And uh -huh. plus I had some talent in writing and public speaking and things like that. So right. I thought maybe my I should go more towards my natural talents, even so it would be a little bit easier road. But um, I just couldn't shake it. You know, I, I didn't go to medical school right away. I took two years off and I kind of said to myself, I'll explore a little bit try to see if anything bites and then if, if I'll, and I'll apply to medical school if I get in the first time I'll go right. <laughs> if not then I'll figure something else out <laughs> uh, typical 20 something with trying to figure it all out so yeah um the lord blessed I well I, I did some teaching I did uh, -huh. uh teaching for a year so was that your calling teaching no, ah. no, 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 no. I realized, I realized pretty quickly that that is not my calling. It takes a very special anointing. And I said, this is the hardest job in the world. I, I need to go I get out of here and go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> These kids gosh. are something else. God bless all the teachers out there. Yes. I really, I really, um, that experience gave me a lot more, a greater appreciation for how hard that job is. Yes. But, um, so I, after... Two years off, I decided to go ahead, pursue my goal. Um, I got in the first time, which because it was difficult. A lot of people have to apply many times and go through different courses. So I think it must have been God's will for yes. me to get in because he knew that if I didn't make it that first, I probably would have yeah, yeah, just yeah. Uh, forget it. Uh, and there were plenty of, <coughs> excuse me, there were plenty mm -hmm. of um, obstacles mm -hmm. along the way, certain courses that were really difficult and mm -hmm. Um, but How'd you overcome those? Um, obviously, God is is the orchestrator of all of it. He he was my strength and my family. Uh huh. Uh, good friends. Wow. Um, I really appreciate all of those challenges that I went through in medical school and in training because I do feel like they made me the person I am today. Mm -hmm. I I I feel very fearless Good. at this point in my life. Fearless, I feel that's awesome. I feel like there is um, really nothing that I can't overcome. Wow. Know? And I kind of developed this system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would uh, imagine that uh, I I was looking at my life through a camera lens. Okay. You know, and if everything in the moment, if I was afraid of something that is going to happen soon, like a test was coming up in uh, two weeks, and I don't feel prepared for it, and you mm -hmm. know, and it's really giving me anxiety, then I would zoom in on where I am right now, and I would think, well, right now, I ha I'm well fed, I, I'm safe, I have a family, I have this book in front of me, I can do more work to prepare. And if I'm afraid of something or anxious about something that's happening right now, like I'm going through a breakup or whatever, I would zoom out and I would think about all the times before I'd gone through breakups and survived and all the times in the future that I'll probably be in another good relationship. So all of those things kind of were, uh, I developed um, through going through the trials and other things that I use now. Okay, can we have, we have a little, little break? Yeah, a little break. <laughs> a pause for the cause. A pause for the crying cause. Little one. Yes, one of my grandbabies. Oh, she's better now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you go outside. Yeah, so you said that you had challenges mm -hmm. 
and that uh, it was God first and then your family, uh, family mm -hmm. and your friends mm -hmm. and your instructors that really just rooted you on mm -hmm. and helped you through those hard times. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Mentors, too. That was important in every uh, uh, field. Having uh, mentors that can guide you that, that have been through the same process. Uh -huh. And those, mm -hmm. those were also uh, very integral in making it through. Wonderful. That is great. Well, I tell you what. After uh, your medical school um, experience came your residency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So talk about that, because a lot of people, they think that, oh, well, you know, I made it through medical school. Mm -hmm. And everybody think just because you made it through medical school that that's it, mm -hmm. that you're a doctor, right. which you are. Mm -hmm. But the, what is the purpose of the residency? So residency is, is very important because... Um, you know, really you can't do anything with an MD degree. Well, you can do some things, but not what you planned on doing. Um, you can't do much with it without a residency training. So mm -hmm. in the early days of medicine, you really didn't have to necessarily do a residency. Most people were just, they were family doctors. They okay. took care of everything. True. You know, that's true. Head to toe, all the general. And that still is a specialty, family medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great specialty, but you these days you have to also do a residency program mm. to um, to, to specialize in it. Okay. Um, my specialty of emergency medicine is three years, and basically you're a, a full-time employee and you're a full-time student still, kind of. Mm -hmm. you, you have uh, didactics or lectures, mm -hmm. either daily or, or weekly. Mm -hmm. um, you, you still have to pass board exams, okay. so you're studying for those. Um, and then you're working a full complement of a workload. Wow! So it's you know you, it's more than a notion. Mm-hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a it's a bigger challenge. Every every mountain you get over, there's another one wow. bigger waiting for you. And pretty that's much. Something. Yeah. So, so what can, how do you keep your momentum? How do you keep your energy up? Bread bowl. Oh. <laughs> 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 Tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell the yeah. truth and shame the devil. I yeah, hear you, you do. You take. I mean, there's. You build a pretty big sleep deficit, uh -huh. um, and you just keep going. You just have to. You really. You know, they say when when you're going through hell, don't stop. That's keep right. going. That's right. That's right. So you, you know didn't stop. You're right. There's an end to it, and. You know, medical school is obviously very expensive, so mm -hmm. you incur debt, and you know, you you know that if you don't complete the training, there's you're not going to be able to get to the final goal. Wow. So, well, I praise yeah. God you got through. Me too. Got Me through. too. And then <laughs> God opened up a fellowship for you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was another year. Was How another did you feel about training. that? You know, I, I when I first started residency, I was so I was like, I am. This is it. You know, one of the greatest things about emergency medicine is that the residency is only three years. So mm -hmm. it's like, I'm getting out of here. Mm -hmm. Don't want another book after this. Right, right. <laughs> Which is silly because in medicine, it's, it's continual learning. You have to study pretty much for the rest of your life just okay. to stay on top of things. But it's good. Mm -hmm. um, but there was uh, opportunity to do additional training or subspecialty in hospice and palliative care. Mm -hmm. Which is? Uh, so hospice and palliative care is especially the focuses on people who have um, potentially life-threatening or life-shortening diseases, mm -hmm. serious chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. um, palliative care, the, the palliative care side of it um, is pretty much symptom management, looking at the person as a whole. Okay. Uh, so these are, it was the, it was developed initially around cancer diagnoses, okay. but we, it's now used very broadly. Mm. So we help with pain management, you know, anxiety, sleeplessness, all the things that come with having a chronic disease. Wow. Somebody might have end stage heart failure, and they might see their cardiologist, mm -hmm. um, you know, several times a year. Okay. But their cardiologist is pretty much managing the heart failure, okay. you know, like making sure that the heart is getting its max maximum capacity, um, mm -hmm. those things. But they're not help, ne not necessarily going to, in their visits, talk about, you know, the sleeplessness, the whatever medication that they're taking to keep them from feeling short of breath, right. all these medications together causing side effects, constipation, anxiety, all these right. things. Right. Um, so we deal with that. We, okay. We're kind of like an adjunct. And then, um, of course, hospice is for people who have a life expectancy of, uh, reasonably life expectancy of six months or less. Wow. Um, and 
there, you know, we get people enrolled to help. It, it allows the family and the patient to have additional help. So you get uh, a nurse that visits you at least once a week mm. uh, at home or mm-hmm. wherever you choose to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, spiritual care, social work mm-hmm. that helps with the financial size of things in the family. Wonderful. And there's uh, counselors that come and speak with families. So. And it's kind of some people wonder how this goes together with emergency mm-hmm. medicine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, emergency medicine is the gateway. It's kind of like the safety net for mo- a lot of people. Even though people are getting more health care, okay. um, you know, sometimes they still don't know how to navigate the healthcare care system. Gotcha. So they just, they, the easiest thing is just to go to the emergency room. Yes. So we get a lot of people who um, have chronic diseases like cancers mm-hmm. and they'll come back or heart failure mm-hmm. and they come back again and again and again. Wonderful. Or we have um, Alzheimer's patients who have behavioral issues and their okay. families don't know what to do so they just bring them to the emergency room. Yeah. And this is a, a time where we can intervene okay. and instead of them having these repeated admissions that aren't helping we can direct them towards having something, a, a more appropriate long term okay. plan. Yes. You know, as long as medicine has is getting it's becoming so advanced that there's constantly more things that you're able to do okay. more interventions that you can do mm-hmm. but the question is are we are we going to sit down and talk about what we should do okay like what's appropriate for this patient and that's very important yeah. talking about what we should do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's awesome yeah. that is awesome and so um where do you see yourself in five years with this um career hmm. path that's a good question um well like you said, I'm getting ready to go to Dallas. Yes. Parkland Hospital. Parkland yes. Hospital. I got to remember that because yeah. people ask me. Yeah. And the first thing I say is, oh, it's where JFK. JFK. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it sounds like um, we're coming to the end of our first show. Okay. <laughs> and we thank you so much. This is Glamour Shop Talk, worshipcenter.net. And we thank you, Candace. And we want to say bye-bye, but you'll be back with us. I sure will. Okay. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Glamour Shop Talk. Join us again every Wednesday at 3 p.m. And visit us at GlamourSalons.com. Welcome to Glamour Shop Talk with your host, Vicki Johnson. Hello, this is Glamour Shop Talk at worshipcenter.net. Thank you, listening audience, for joining me today. And I want to just say hello to Candace Johnson. Hello, everyone. Dr. Candace Johnson. She's my youngest daughter. And I thank you for joining me today before you go off to the South. That's Dallas, Texas. I wanted my daughter to come on the radio with me to just testify and just tell her Uh, experience and uh, what she saw when we started Glamour Salon in 1996 Um, how she viewed her parents 
walking through this vision that God had given them and how she benefited from it and maybe how she didn't benefit from it. But uh, I I just think that it's so important. I want people to, because so many people want to open up a salon. And I know that Glamour Salon is a different type of salon. And it's actually the template for uh, workplace wisdom salons, for salons that have Christian-based guidelines. Um, So today, first of all, I want to just start off with prayer. And so, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your loving kindness, and we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for peace and joy and happiness. We thank you for vision. We thank you, Lord, that this is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing in it. We thank you that we totally trust and depend upon you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your patience. And Father God, we thank you for family right now. I thank you for my children. I thank you for my husband. I thank you for my church family. And Lord, we give you honor, we give you glory, and we we give you praise. And we just ask that someone be blessed in our listening audience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, Candice, we ended up and uh, we were talking about um, your calling. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, that you're called into medicine and that you are an ER doctor with a specialty in palliative care. And you were explaining to us what that was. Mm -hmm. And it's a new field in the medical business, correct? It's pretty relatively new. Mm -hmm. Uh, The combining of both ER and palliative care has been going on. When I take my boards, I think I'm within the first 200 in the country to um, be board certified in both ER and palliative care. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And we thank God that you're more than a conqueror in mm-hmm. that area mm-hmm. uh, because we need that. Mm-hmm. We need godly conscious people that's yes. going to give um, a Holy Spirit view mm-hmm. of what they should do concerning this area. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, um, obviously, your spirituality comes into play mm-hmm. when you're talking about end of life issues mm-hmm. and um, even serious illness. You mm-hmm. know, there's often I've, people will talk about, um, you know, wanting to believe for a miracle. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's good to have uh, some perspective of where they're coming from with yes. that. I've heard some colleagues, you know, mm-hmm. almost, um, you know, just dismiss mm. people's um, choices and, and hope in their belief belief for miracles. When you know, from a medical side, it it does look pretty impossible. Mm-hmm. But you, I never want to stand in the position. What I tell my patients is, I I want to believe for a miracle for you too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but God doesn't need me to perform a miracle. He doesn't Amen. need these machines to perform a miracle. Amen. And Girl, you got it going on. That's <laughs> that's so true. So I, I never want to discourage anyone because I do believe in miracles and I've seen them. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes. We can confuse that with just our need to not let go, you know, Man, when someone's true. very chronically ill mm-hmm. at the end of their life, because we, we all have an end. Yes. Um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult you know, to say, like, no, don't put another IV and another this, another mm-hmm. that, more medicine, more machines, you know. And mm-hmm. and we want people to be able to make their transitions peacefully mm-hmm. and, um, you know, with a settled mind. So it's a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be invited into a family or or you know inserted sometimes uh-huh. not invited but uh-huh. inserted into a family at these difficult times yeah um you know it's 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 an honor so i i do i appreciate that i've, I've gone on this path and the lord has led me on this path i think i'll have lots of good work to do in dallas mm-hmm. i um, do too and i think you you're called to this because as i said in the earlier show I was talking to your residency head Mm -hmm. at the uh, graduation, when you graduated from residency. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she alluded to was how compassionate you were. Mm -hmm. And she had never seen anyone that compassionate Mm -hmm. and relatable to the actual patients. 
and she was in tears. Mm. And it made me cry. Yeah. Because that says so much about you as a human being. Mm. Because as Jesus touched our infirmities, mm -hmm. God in you, uh, you've allowed to suppress yourself to let the God in you touch the infirmities mm -hmm. of individuals that you deal with mm -hmm. and not let your education be so in the forefront mm -hmm. that you are not allowing your, your heart to be shared. Mm -hmm. So I want to say thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for representing uh, God in an awesome way. Thank you for representing your dad and I in an awesome way. And thank you for representing your church family mm -hmm. in an awesome way. And I'm sure that Dallas, what's the name of the hospital? Parkland Hospital. Parkland Hospital will be better for you coming there. Um, I know that that's a call from God as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're Well, gonna I'd like to just insert that I, I think one reason it's so easy to do that is because we saw that in you and dad as well. You know, I think you guys do this. You do the same thing with your ministry through the Glamour Salon. It's not just a place where people come and get their hair done. and They're very skilled at that. But mm -hmm. um, you, you're you very compassionate when people come in and they're mm -hmm. down. You know, this thing, everything can stop mm -hmm. so that we can stop and have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, we make people feel good and welcome anyway. They come in, they get a tour, mm -hmm. their name is announced. You know, mm -hmm. when a, someone has a birthday, your name is announced. So it's just important to see people as as family yes. and that's how I try to look at my patients mm -hmm. you know I try to look at it as if this is my mom or my dad or my cousin or whoever right. you know, even when it's it's a bad situation mm -hmm. you know if someone was involved with a fight or something violent and they're shot you know I still mm -hmm. you have to put all of that aside and mm -hmm. see them as a human being mm -hmm. in need of help and I think I saw that a lot coming up uh, watching the way you ministered through your talents mm -hmm. at, at Glimmer Salon. Well, one thing I have to give God the glory for, um, so many times he's sat me down in my prayer time and given me revelation. And this is what I attribute that to because I can't, I can't really take credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, he said, Vicki, and he spoke to me just like this. He said, I'm a spirit. Mm hmm he said, and I need a body to work through. Mm. And when you hug someone mm -hmm. or give someone a sisterly or a kiss mm -hmm. or when you sit and listen to them mm -hmm. or when you give out of your heart, that's me. Mm -hmm. You're showing them me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. wow, okay. That might seem simple to somebody else, but it just... It made a stamp mm -hmm. on my memory and in my heart yeah. that I'm representing God and that the only way people can see God is through me. Yeah. I think it was the bishop said, Bishop Andrew Merritt mm -hmm. said, um, you know, for some people, you're the only Jesus they will ever see. Wow. You know? Yeah. Until they get to know him for themselves. Yes. You know, you, we have to be his representation. And that's in whatever you do. If you're a street sweeper. That's right. You, know, you have to sweep with a, you know, Smile. with love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if you're the, the meter maid, even though everybody else is probably mad at to see you coming, you right. know, still <laughs> do it with love and that's do right. it with uh, rep representing Christ. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that that's so important. Mm -hmm. And so having that um, spoken to me, that rhema word. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't feel like it was something uh, I was willing to do that. Uh -huh. Willing to remember before I go off on somebody. Yep. You represent Christ. That's right. Willing to, you know, before uh, I, I'm trying to get one up. Mm -hmm. Remember, you represent Christ. Yep. So I, I thank God for that. And I thank God that, um, that you benefited from seeing your dad and I do mm -hmm. that because as well with him being in private practice, mm -hmm. he's given mm -hmm. and and tried to be the man of God and be an example of God's love mm -hmm. with his clients. Yeah. Going over and beyond, having prayer with them, anointing them, mm -hmm. um, even the little children, mm -hmm. giving them Bibles, uh -huh. yes, yeah. and going out of his way um, to make sure that they know Jesus. Yeah. You know, in a wonderful way. As you said, he had he would have his own private Bible study with you all. Mm -hmm. So since you guys are grown, he 
he's looking for some other he children. Needs, he needs some more parishioners. Yeah. <laughs> for his church. Join Dwayne R. Johnson Church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. His Bible studies aren't long either, so mm-hmm. you have to worry about Pretty standing short. too long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very interactive as well. <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, and we only take children. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. So, yeah. Uh, you're going to Parkland, and um, uh, you're going to start your new career there. And God, I believe God supernaturally worked that out as well. Me too. Yeah. Because I remember when you were in medical school, mm-hmm. you made a comment to me that you felt like God had something for you in Dallas. Mm-hmm. But when you got out of your fellowship, completed your fellowship mm-hmm. tour, um, you were a little kind of more open to go to other places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dallas was the first place, mm-hmm. I think, in three other places. Yeah. Um, they offered an interview at, in Atlanta mm-hmm. and here mm-hmm. at the place where I currently work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Lord blessed where you got this awesome offer. Mm-hmm. I think an offer you couldn't refuse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they made it worth my while. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I mean, they packed you up and everything. Yeah. Yep. I mean, who could not? I have to try at least. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That it was. They they welcomed me with open arms. Mm-hmm. So it's always nice to go where you're wanted. Yes. And um, so how how is it? Um, we're getting back to the family. Mm-hmm. You're the youngest. Um, how was it being the youngest of two? And, uh, you know, having a mom and a dad that were entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and and being in the church family. Um, did you feel like you had to live up to a certain expectation uh, because of your older sister or? Um, um, I definitely think that you all set the tone for our family. You know, there were no losers in the family. Nope. <laughs> no losers allowed. You nope. know, you put your best efforts forward. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we struggled in a class, you know, you, you all sat down with us, you worked with us, got us resources, whatever uh, was necessary. You mm-hmm. guys read with us very early on. Mm-hmm. Um and there was just there were expectations, and I think I thank God for that because you know from my short time in education and teaching, I can see that if you set the bar low, that that will be, that bar low bar will be met. You know, because <laughs> right. kids don't want to necessarily put all that effort, and they have you they have to be taught, and it has to be expected. Yeah, and I don't think that there are any dumb kids. I really no. don't. I just think they that they may not have had the environment necessary to cultivate their talents right and um and the expectation right more than anything else you know i remember right. coming home with a report card in high school with uh, all b's mm-hmm. straight across and dad said okay all right that's fine but this is the floor <laughs> he said, this is, this is where you're only allowed to go up <laughs> it's like this is you know and the next i came back and i had half a's half b's right. you know so it's right. just like you know, we don't do, this is not a C household. Right. And, and there's no shame in that. And, and there's pe- people out there. And of course, once I got to college, things got a little tougher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a C, but I went back and corrected right. it, you know. Right, right, And it's not it's not to put down anyone who doesn't necessarily get all A's and B's. But the, the thing is, as a family, as a, as parents, you know, you shouldn't be, the kids should not be severely punished if they don't right. get perfect grades. Right. But there should be an investigation into what is the problem. Right. And there should be some targeted uh, solutions being offered, mm-hmm. and the and it should still be said. Yes, you might have gotten a C. Yes, you might have gotten a D. But the expectation is A's. This right. is the expectation, right? And we're going to do whatever we need to do as parents to help get you back to where you're supposed to be. That's right. That's because good. You're, you're, you 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 define your children's identity initially. You know, right. Of course, as they get older, they start to build on their own. But that foundation comes from the parents. Right. So that was probably that. I mean, my sister is two years older than me. She was very talented and um you know so there was probably a little bit of uh living in her shadow for a bit but mm-hmm. i think i kind of as i got older and we were closer and mm-hmm. i knew how to to use it to my advantage mm-hmm. <laughs> instead yeah. of it being a, a bad stumbling thing. block huh? yeah she was a little bit better behaved than i was so some of my teachers would tell uh, me no uh, in school I, like, I sure wish you were like your sister <laughs> uh, oh well i don't know about that but yeah. um 
Yeah, I think you guys both had your own personalities. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I never, ever allow people to do is compare my children. Mm -hmm. Now, people will do that yeah. regardless of what you say, but I didn't allow them to do it in my face right. or in my presence. Mm -hmm. Or if I found out about it, I would most definitely say something. Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11, which is one of the scriptures I always meditate on, mm -hmm. And uh, reference to when I'm talking to people and their uh, future, that God has a plan and a purpose mm -hmm. for your life. Mm -hmm. And even the very way you laugh, mm -hmm. you know, what you laugh at, mm -hmm. that was planned by God mm -hmm. because you needed to have a, a certain type of sense of humor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so you would attract. Because the truth of the matter is Candace is a people attractor. People <laughs> love her. And they just draw to her because she's fun to be around. She's compassionate. And, you know, she's not going to sit and wait for you to say hi. Mm -hmm. You know, neither one of my children. Um, they're not going to do that. They're going to engage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I thank God for that. And I thank God that um, people do attract to you because, as I said, I think it's God-given. Mm -hmm. And it's important as a parent to recognize what are the characteristics that God placed in your children mm -hmm. so you can help that grow. Yeah. And that uh, they can walk out the, the purpose and plan for their lives. And so as you go to Dallas mm -hmm. and um, this is the end of your medical school education and residency education but like you said in the last show you never stop learning when you're a doctor yeah. because medicine is ever evolving um i asked you in the last show where do you see yourself in the next five years Whew. so um you know i'm still figuring that out you know I, this uh i i definitely will still be practicing emergency medicine mm -hmm. um and integrating palliative care. Mm -hmm. So we, my, the plan is to kind of um, help the hospital to integrate it and get, mm -hmm. become, have it more of a, a presence in our emergency department. It's an academic institution, so I'm going to be teaching mm. um, residents how to do good emergency medicine and symptom mm -hmm. control and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Let's say I'm 33. Hopefully, I'll have a husband. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, that's in the plan. <laughs> and so that could that could husband throw a wrench in children. Things. Yeah, we'll see. I don't yeah. know. Whatever God has for me. Honestly, I think that's another thing about, um, especially my field. Mm -hmm. You see how fragile life can be. It, life is interesting. It can be very fragile at times and very resilient at times. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean I, by very fragile? Uh, you know, just certain things. I mean. Could, in the emergency department, unfortunately, you deal with a lot of death. Mm -hmm. um, so wow. it can be, you know, some a kid with an asthma attack yeah. and, you know, okay, the, different I things like that. So unexpected. It, yeah, unexpected changes. Yes. And so you kind of have to learn to roll with things, you yes. know, and improvise yes. and adjust. Yeah. That's a, a big you part be of it. Change, you huh? got to be willing to change. You got to be willing to change. I love that. Yeah. And that's, and that's one thing I love about you because you are a student of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to learn mm -hmm. and to um, allow God to infill you with more of him, mm -hmm. of his word. As I said, um, you're a type of person that has always, even as a little girl, <laughs> been a little evangelist. <laughs> not, not in the fanatical way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you would share your love of Jesus with people on the playground, um, in the classroom, at the dances. Yeah. I mean, you were just that, just, you know. I just, just always that. thought I could never honestly call a person my friend without telling them about Jesus. That would be like wow. having a friend that, you know, was getting ready to lose their house and you just won a million dollars and you're not offering them any help. You know wow. what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Or That's a friend that awesome. you know is hungry and you've got a loaf of bread in your pocket and you, you can't call someone a friend wow. if you don't give them the one thing that you know they need. Wow. You know, whether awesome. they decide to take it or not is up to them, but right. you got to at least offer it. That's it. Or you That's can't awesome. call yourself a friend. Wow. That's awesome. I love that, Candace. That's, whew, that taught me something right there. <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to call yourself a friend or call them a friend, mm -hmm. 
the, the most precious thing in your life is the salvation that mm -hmm. God's given you through his son, Jesus Christ, yep. and the blood that's shed on the cross. And if you don't share that, mm. yeah, what, what good? I mean, even sharing your money. Right. What is it? Nothing. That's so here today, gone tomorrow. That's true. That's true. In this society. Mm -hmm. So um, that's awesome. So your five-year plan you know, you just leaning and trusting. Yeah, in God. I'm gonna do whatever the Lord. When He opens a door, I'm gonna walk through it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's. I, I'm excited. This is kind of my first real job. Wow. <laughs> I've been in school, and studied all this time. And, uh huh. How many um, years did you study? Um, I completed well undergrad, four mm -hmm. years, five years of medical school, mm -hmm. uh, three years of residency. So mm. it's, been a long road. It's been yeah. a long road. It's yeah. been worth it. Yeah. But you know it. what? Uh, the Bible even talks about the race is not given to the spirit, mm -hmm. but those that endure to the end. Yep. And much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. So we know that in this society, uh, doctors are some of the most respected professions in this country. And that when you guys speak, people listen. Mm -hmm. So it's important that your character and your integrity is tested mm -hmm. before you get that white coat. That's true. And that title before your name, doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's so important that we don't wear it with arrogance. Right. And with piousness mm -hmm. and with greed mm -hmm. because it is a serious uh, profession. I don't think that you should just go into it for the money mm -mm. or the prestige but it should be something that is deep in your heart, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and the Latin word that the word physician is derived from also means teacher. Mm. Uh, so it's always been meant to be a profession where, you know, the teaching is integral mm. in what we do. Okay. And that's, if it, that's, that can be something like me in academic medicine where I'm training residents or it could just be in teaching your patients how, better, how to live better, how mm -hmm. to manage their disease better, how mm -hmm. to, you know... Um, and then, you know, especially in palliative care, too, when you get into having these talks mm -hmm. with people about, you know, their life and what's going on, you you do sometimes get the opportunity to talk mm -hmm. about the Lord. And, I, you know, I look for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm excited about all that that's to come. That's awesome. Know? Yeah. Like that a, is awesome. So you have I your plan. I can't place? necessarily predict <laughs> no. what the five years are going to no. look like. You but. know, that's just a can get question. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> no, you but. know, they ask all, everybody else, actually, what are you doing five? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever I'm it not is, not. I know that uh, it's good. It's going to be good. I do too. It's going to be good. Even if there's challenges, which I suspect there will be, mm -hmm. those are good too. I count those as joy. Mm -hmm. They're opportunities opportunities to grow yes and uh, learn yes so. I think that that is so good mm -hmm. I I heard a man say yesterday that there's no such thing as failure mm -hmm. and I'm waiting for him to expound on that yeah. but what he said just blew me away mm -hmm. he said there's no such thing as failure because if you don't achieve a certain thing there's a lesson to be learned mm -hmm in it mm -hmm. so that you can apply it mm -hmm. so you can get better. Yeah. And that's deep mm -hmm. because lessons are the key to living a overcoming life. Right. If you don't get the lessons, I mean, you almost just, just exist. Yeah. You know, so I thought that was really, really good. And, and I think that, um, that you know, these things mm -hmm. and that you're going to apply them and that, that, Nothing but good things. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, challenges, like you said, mm -hmm. because I believe God has a even greater calling for your life mm -hmm. um, that you don't even know of. Mm -hmm. But um, he's going to put you on a worldwide platform. Mm -hmm. And so I thank God for that because um, he's preparing you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, though, let's switch back because um, I, I, I want to get back to the salon. Okay. And, Talk about that some and give kind of ask some questions of you. You know that Glamour Salon, uh, which is located at 28801 Southfield Road, mm -hmm. um, is a template for workplace wisdom salons mm -hmm. and that we are run differently. We're mm -hmm. not a booth rental salon. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a team-based salon. Also, when you come there, you have great opportunities of employment. Um, we do have prayer 
we do emphasize oneness. Whoever uh, is the most talented in a certain field mm -hmm. is the person who uh, you are allowed to ask to service you mm -hmm. because we don't own anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so in saying all that, I wanted to, because you've been to the salon numerous amount of mm -hmm. times. <laughs> she was raised, as, as she said, her and her sister are shop babies. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but we're talking about when Glamour Salon opened up in 1996. Mm -hmm. And you saw this. Um, how do you compare, um, as you said, you've lived in the South. How do you compare our salon? with salons that you visited. I mean, what would make you, if you weren't my daughter, mm -hmm. what would make you come to Glamour Salon? I mean, because it's not the cheapest place. Mm -mm. And it's not, um, you, you're not going to get out in five minutes. Mm -mm. So why would you come? Well, the quality um, of the service you're getting mm -hmm. um, is is the main thing in, in the environment. Uh you get what you pay for in life, and especially, okay. you know, in hair. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, like you said, it's not the cheapest. It's not astronomically expensive either. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, that nobody's um, gouging anyone. Right. But there's, there's, they use quality products, mm -hmm. and they have quality stylists. Mm -hmm. Mom, you've been doing hair, what, over 40 years, 35 years? About 36, 36 37 years. years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And I do like the way that um, everyone works together seamlessly. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever is available, you know, if you come in, you're not waiting for your stylist to be done so that they can wash your hair. There's people who will pitch in. Anytime mm -hmm. somebody is sitting idle, someone else is coming to pitch in and, and grab them. I remember, I don't know if it people uh, everywhere have heard of Jay Alexander's. It's mm -hmm. a restaurant that's mm -hmm. a national chain. Uh, a good friend of mine in college worked for them. And I used to always, when I went there, would be like, how this service is mm -hmm. different than other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. it was is that you didn't have just one server always coming to you. It was like their whatever... If there was a hot plate ready, somebody there were like multiple people that came to help, mm -hmm. and I noticed how quickly everything went and how mm -hmm. smooth and like you could ask anyone to grab you this or that. Mm -hmm. And when my friend went to work there, she talked about how intense their training was um, for for servers. It was okay. like several months long, and they had to they worked on a team system and they perfected that. Wow! Uh, and it's the same way with you all. You know, it's not like one person you're counting on to do everything. You guys work as a team, yes. which brings. Um, a, a greater experience for everyone and wow. there's no contention you don't feel like oh I saw that her do that one hairstyle last week I want that he doesn't nobody feels bad about going to, to try other things everyone is together so that's, that's awesome yeah well I thank you for Candace oh it's thank my pleasure you so much for spending this time with mom yes. and taking this time out of your busy schedule <laughs> and once again we invite you to come to Glamour Salon at 28801 Southfield Road Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Glamour Shop Talk. Join us again every Wednesday at 3 p.m. And visit us at GlamourSalons.com.